Hello, everybody. Uh, so we're going to start off uh, our course in uh, experimental engineering, uh, which is some basics about measurement, about uh, some of the, the process of turning a, um, a physical quantity into some kind of number that we can use. And so that's what measure, measurement is. It's an assignment of a specific value, a number, uh, to a physical variable. And we want to do that so that we can manipulate those values, use them in equations, figure out relationships between different kinds of um, uh, physical quantities. Uh, and we want to do it in a way that makes it as easy for us to manipulate that data, data as possible. Um, and that's what the measurement process is here. And it's got four stages uh, that you can see here, from sensor to transduction uh, to conditioning to output. Uh, and each one of those has a particular purpose. Um, the sensor uh, is a physical element that uh, employs some kind of natural phenomenon that might be uh, the expansion of a liquid in a liquid thermometer. Uh, it might be um, uh, some kind of electromagnetic effect um, in, say, the Hull effect or in a thermocouple uh, that allows us to uh, turn that physical variable into some change uh, that becomes a little easier to measure. Oftentimes, either a change in position, like the uh, thermometer, uh, the liquid moving up a thermometer, or a voltage. A voltage is one that we'll use uh, quite a bit uh, and is uh, very useful because it's easy to turn that into, uh, into computer data. So one example of that that we'll sort of talk through this is an atomic force microscope. Uh, which we are not going to use, <laughs> but it's useful to sort of think about. Uh, and the sensor for that uh, microscope is actually a little rod here uh, with a needle on it. Okay, and it, we drag that needle over a sample surface um, uh, in order to find what that, that, the contours of that surface. And so the sensor is actually that little needle uh, itself. Now, that little needle itself doesn't actually tell us anything. Uh, we want to turn this into a number, and so we need to transduce that uh, sense change uh, into something that is quantifiable, into a detectable signal. And so with uh, AFM, what happens is this guy's bouncing, on, we're dragging this along the surface, it's bouncing. Uh, and so we have a laser that bounces light off of this and it hits some photodiodes. And so those dyads can recognize when the laser is hitting them. Uh, and so we can use that to determine what positional changes happen to the needle. So the needle itself is the sensor. It senses that surface. Uh, the transducer uh, is the laser and the photodiodes that turn that into an electrical signal. Now, a signal conditioner takes that signal. Oftentimes, when we're conditioning, we're talking about an electrical signal, a voltage. Um, and it tries to clean it up uh, because electrical signals tend to be messy. Uh, they might have some um, noise in them, some outside frequency that we're not really interested in. Or maybe there's some changes that happen really fast that we're, uh, we're not trying to follow. Uh, and so we try to condition that signal. That might be amplifying it. It might be filtering out unwanted noise. And so here you can see what's called a low pass filter. So if my original signal is in green here, you can see I've got you know, a, a, an excess really high frequency signal on top of the blue signal, right? If I wanna get rid of that, the ups and downs in the greens and just see that blue signal, we can do that with a conditioner, with a, in this case, with a filter. Um, and then that allows us to, uh, to get a better sense of what is, uh, what's happening that we're trying to measure. So in an AFM, uh, any kinds of, you know, this say, for instance, this uh, little needle as it bounces along here might actually experience some vibrations. Uh, we're not interested in those vibrations. We just want to know the position. And so we might filter out uh, the high frequency vibrations uh, so that we can see the position of the needle better uh, with our signal. 
Finally, we need to actually have something that produces that signal for us, that, that we can see that signal so that we can manipulate it. Uh, and this is our output stage. Uh, and oftentimes with a voltage, that's going to be a, com a computer of some sort or a, some kind of digital display. In our class, we'll use uh, uh, microcontrollers to do this. Uh, so a, a Raspberry Pi Pico um, that will help us uh, log our data uh, and then look at that data. So those are the four stages. Sensing is that physical change in our sensor. Transduction turns that into something that we can see or uh, record. Signal conditioning cleans up that signal and then the output actually shows us that signal. Uh, but one of the things that we need to know is, okay, now I've got a voltage, right? My AFM say produces a, a set of changing voltages because these diodes light up in different ways. How do I actually know what that means? Uh, and that process is called calibration. Um, and calibration means uh, that we're going to try and match an input value, that is whatever we're measuring, let's say in this case uh, a temperature, uh, to an output value. So you can imagine um, if I didn't have this scale, the 20, 30, and 40, I have a sensor here. Uh, it gets transduced into a positional change because of the uh, cross-sectional area of this little um, uh, tube in there. And so that transduces it. There's no real conditioner here. Uh, but the output uh, is how is the actual position, right? How far I am along this. Well, if I, you know, as in the case sometimes, if this is just a piece of paper that's stuck into a thermometer, and that piece of paper shifts, I'm going to get wrong answers all the time, right? Or if the piece of paper, the numbers are too close together or too far apart, uh, I'm going to get wrong answers. And so we need to calibrate that to actually position that piece of paper correctly, and we need to calibrate it to figure out how far apart those numbers should be. How much does the position change when my temperature changes uh, by 10 degrees? Um, and so that, a lot, that means that's something that we need to do in calibration. And in order to do that, we're going to use what's called a standard. A standard is a measurement, is some physical quantity that we know what the quantity is, right? So think about the kilogram. What is a kilogram? Uh, well, at one point, in fact, not that long ago, a kilogram was a cylinder of platinum that is locked in a vault in, in Paris. That was the kilogram. And every other standard we compared to that kilogram uh, to make sure that it was, you know, actually what a kilogram was. Now that you can see the problems with that, and one of them is that uh, everything changes. You know, the more we know about quantum, uh, nothing's stable, and so even that platinum would change uh, its mass over time. Uh, and so now, uh, since 2008, 18, that's actually tied to Planck's constant, which is constant, which is not going to change. And so we can remake that standard knowing exactly what it is. Now, I tell you how it's related to Planck's constant, but I started to dig into that, and I, <laughs> you don't want to know, I, I got lost about halfway through and said, ah, it's related to Planck's constant. It's going to be, it's going to be constant. Okay. And everything else, so we have length measurements that we have standards. And then those standards we can send out, you can see this table down here, a primary standard is going to be something that's very carefully maintained, it's very expensive to maintain. Uh, and then we're going to transfer those standards to lower and lower things so that, for instance, the 50 gram weight that you might use in an intro lab, uh, that would be called a working standard. We're going to assume that that's 50 grams. When we're done with calibration, we have what's called a calibration curve. Uh, and you can see that over here. Uh, and this is actually spend, we're spending a little bit of time. Uh, this tells us a couple of things. It tells us the sensitivity of our instrument. Um, so usually down here, uh, we'll have the physical quantity that we're trying to measure, say mass or temperature. Um, and over here, we'll have the output, which uh, in a lot of cases is going to be, when we're coming up with a sensitivity curve, is going to be a voltage. Okay, so let's say we have a load cell, which measures force. Um, I might have force values down here, 1 newton, 2 newton, 3 newton, 4 newtons. 
And this over here is going to be in voltage that tells me, okay, once I apply three newtons of force to my um, to my load cell, it's going to read, you know, roughly six volts. Okay, that tells us that a lot that takes that transduced voltage uh, and then tells us, oh, this is what that actually represents. The sensitivity is the slope. Okay, the red line here. And you can see that that slope is not necessarily the same, right? If this was a calibration curve, my sensitivity down here is actually different down here. Um, what we want is a linear curve, okay? But that doesn't always happen because measurement systems and sensors are complicated physical things. Uh, and they don't always behave exactly how we want them to. And so if my calibration curve is here, we might just say, oh, this is linear between two newtons and four newtons. Uh, and then we wouldn't use this instrument to measure stuff down here because we'd be getting different answers uh, and we'd need a more complicated sensitivity equation. Uh, so sometimes our calibration curve is linear. Sometimes it's not linear, but we only use the linear section of that calibration curve. So that's sensitivity, and you can see it's represented by uh, a differential equation here, right? This is just telling us the change in voltage as my quantity changes. That's all it is. It's just a, uh, just a slope. The range, on the other hand, on a calibration curve tells us the minimum maximum values that we can use uh, in with this particular instance. So again, if this was... Uh, a load cell, then this could measure from zero to four newtons. If I went above four newtons, I wouldn't really know uh, what voltage to expect, so it wouldn't be a very useful tool. Um, if I'm measuring down here, I have a nonlinear sensitivity curve, so I might not use it over here. So this instrument would have an effective range of about two to four newtons. Uh, likewise, we can talk about its output range. This is going to output from zero volts to about nine volts. Um, and let's say that's the limit here. It might be that I might do what's called saturate. If I put a 10 Newton load on this, it might still give me a reading of nine volts. And that's what we call saturation. If we've, if we've applied so much um, of the quantity or if the quantity is outside of that range, it's gonna give us just a flat zero or it's gonna give us the maximum voltage um, whether it's we change it or not. And so we want to make sure that our instrument isn't saturated, that we're using it within its intended range, both in terms of the input and the output. And that's our uh, quick little introduction to uh, measurement basics.